Okay, now. Okay, well, here we go. Let me. There we go. Please move this window. Okay. All right, so are we happy with what we're seeing now? Everybody should be seeing a work in progress. Yes. Okay, great. No. no? Yeah, I have dual screens and I'm seeing uh, Grant on both of them. But that, that apparently is my problem. Let me screw with it. All right. So I'll uh, start by saying that this is very much a work in progress. Um, what started out as an idea of just uh, sharing some of the latest things I've seen with TNCs and some developments evolved after a conversation with both Scott and uh, I apologize, I didn't have time to plug in Steve's call. I don't have it memorized. Um, and uh, it really became, uh, especially after talking with Steve, the idea of explaining more about where TNCs have come from and where they're probably headed and how that might relate to you as an individual, what you might be looking for in a TNC. As I said, I very much would love feedback in the future for this. Uh, I'm still working on a place that will stick the Word document and the PDF so that we can get some, get some improvement on it. And that is uh, it for that. Let's find the right arrow button to move things forward. There we go. So we'll start out with what's a TNC. It really is. It's a, a it, in its simplest form, it's just a device that uh, lays in between the radio and a terminal, and it does all the job of converting the digital data to audio tone so that it can be sent over the air and going the opposite direction, converting audio tones back to digital data for a terminal to use. What you have inside the TNC is some hardware, and depending upon what generation we're talking about, it's going to vary a little bit. But at its core, all TNCs have a microprocessor, they have a modem, they have software in uh, the device that controls how it works, implements the protocols, kind of does the magical thing that the TNC does of making audio tones into useful data and vice versa. Here's a couple of different drawings of how you'd use a TNC. You can see that in this case, particularly the lower diagram, does it, can you see my mouse? No, yes, maybe. I can see Scott? Yes, I can see. Okay, great, thank you. Yeah. Okay, so you can see in the lower diagram, the most simple layout of all, it's really just a laptop or a computer the terminal node controller acts as an interface between that and the radio. In the upper diagram, you can see a little bit more detail, some of the detail of what the TNC is actually doing, that it's controlling the push to talk line, uh, it's controlling uh, some other functions of the terminal node controller. And in this case, it's showing that it it's handling this for a dumb terminal or a computer. And this is going to get more important as we talk about how the terminal node controller was developed. And up until about the last, I think about 10, 12 years, TNCs have primarily had a serial interface to a computer. As that serial interface went away, we upgraded to a USB interface, which is still a serial interface, but it's as we didn't see conventional RS-232 interfaces on computers anymore, we had to upgrade. Hmm. So the first TNCs came from this idea that the University of Hawaii uh, developed, which was the idea of connecting remote users to their mainframe via wireless packet data, data network. The 
terminal node controller at that time was known as a, a terminal control unit or TCU. And the package consisted of a UHF antenna, the, the radio, a modem, a buffer, and a control unit that did a lot of the work of uh, organizing the data. And you can see in the picture on the right hand side, the woman is using a dumb terminal. Uh, and uh, I don't, I, when I found this picture this afternoon, I was trying to decide, I don't think it's a VT100. But I know I recognize it, so I'm not I'm not sure if anybody can identify that terminal or not. But it that was really the origin of the terminal node controller right there. That box to the right of her had all the guts in it, and you can see down below there how they had the distributed network. So DNCs come along. And hams in Montreal start experimenting with transmitting VHF over VHF, just ordinary data, just asking coded data. They start playing with this idea. And then you had Doug Lockhart uh, here in British Columbia, along with the uh, Vancouver, I should have put in there what that stands for, the Sorry. So it was the Vancouver Area Digital Communication Group is what that stood for. They designed and produced the first hardware TNC specifically for amateur radio use. That was a big watershed moment. And uh, Tapper, uh, I'm a little uh, ignorant of the history of the formation of Tapper, but what led from the Vancouver group's efforts was the production of the first TNC, which was, as Steve so cutely told me, a re it was just known as the TNC before there was the TNC two. It was a 80 or a 6809 based TNC. Um, one of the things that I didn't have an opportunity to delve into was why the TNC two design. Uh, changed and used as Z80. I'm actually gonna, I did see that Steve was around. Um, Steve, if you're familiar with why that happened, I think it might be a worthwhile injection at this point to explain why the Tapper design changed from the 88 or the 6809 to the Z80. Are you aware? Yeah, it was just easier to develop software, assembly line, assembly code software, because there was so much more um, so many more computers out there based on the Z80 than the 6809. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Um, okay, so, and, uh, so you had at that point, most of the manufacturers were licensing the TNC2 design, the Z80 based design. I cracked open my, um, uh, AE, well, actually, it's the Hewlett Packard licensed kit of the AEA PK232. And yeah, sure enough, a Z80 in there. And um, uh, in the Cantronics, I Googled the design because I didn't want to take my, my uh, TNC apart since it's my APRS station right now. And indeed, it still uses a Motorola processor. So they, they've they stayed true to the use of the 6800 series design there. So as computing power grew, the fact that the TNC had a microprocessor in it that was managing a lot of the functions of the TNC moved from being an advantage to being a disadvantage. The idea of offloading a lot of the work that a TNC could do from the TNC to the computer and turning the TNC to nothing more than a modem would be a big improvement because it would provide a lot more versatility. And that was, I think, part of where the name came from, the KISS name. It, we've all heard it, you know, keep it simple, stupid. So with a KISS TNC, you have the computer managing everything 
except for the modulation and demodulation. So the TNC really does, in KISS mode, function as little more than a modem. One of the advantages also is that it's quite a bit less expensive. I'll talk about a TNC that uh, Steve and I have both purchased and are working with that theoretically, if you shop well, it costs less than $40. So that's quite a bit less expensive than a Cantronics TNC now sells for, I believe it's more than $200. So the next step, as we saw computer performance increase, was people developing a software TNC or a TNC where all of the work was done inside the computer, including the uh, analog to digital and digital to analog conversion, and that being handled by a sound card. And this is a subtly different than the sound card modes. It's the same concept, but in in result, well, I guess it's the same in result too, I guess. Um, it really is that we're no longer using an outboard device to handle modulation and demodulation and the computer is responsible for and wired directly to the radio. I, uh, I don't have a lot of personal experience with software modems. I'm familiar with Dire Wolf, but I'm not familiar enough to say in what specific circumstances it's better or worse. I'm aware of other modes as well, and we'll talk about those. But the the whole idea of this movement from a KISS TNC to a software TNC is exciting because it allows quite a bit more experimentation in terms of how you encode the and decode the signal. It really does give a person quite a bit more freedom to experiment. And thanks to Scott for this wonderful list. Um, we can give some examples here. I'll work backwards with the software TNC. So we have the original software TNC, um, the AGW PE uh, software designed by, um, uh, Christ, I don't have in my notes his name in Greece. Then we have Direwolf. Uh, well, we just, we have this series of, different software TNCs. And we have with the KISS, the hardware TNCs, you have the TNC-X. Um, and also in that category with the TNC-X, you also have the TNC-Pi. The TNC-Pi is really nothing more than a hat for a Raspberry Pi, whereas the TNC-X relies, excuse me, it relies on a USB connection to a host computer with a TNC Pi. It's basically using the general purpose uh, input output pins to connect it. And it's a teeny little package. You could, you could kind of look at that as a, a computer and TNC all rolled into one. So in some ways that's kind of the ultimate evolution of a KISS TNC. And I thought I had some, maybe I do have some pictures in here. Hmm. Huh. Nope. I apologize. I thought somewhere in here I had saved a couple of pictures of TNCs, but that must not have gotten saved. Um before I moved it to the server. So, you know, Grant, there's something else that occurs to me. Yes. On the list, there's a category that's not kind of strictly represented there, which is these. So the software TNCs connect instead of serially, like all the other full featured and KISS TNCs just connect via some serial interface, right? Either RS-232 or USB. Yes. Software TNCs connect as an IP port so that's that's how the software interfaces with them, um, yeah. and there's this other option which is um, uh, the, the Northwest Digital Radio product. There's a couple of these out there, right? Um, what's the name of their thing? Their um, drawers. Yeah, the draws device, right? Which is 
it's basically a Pi running a software TNC that's built into hardware with a network port. So instead of having, instead of interfacing your software, uh, your data software with a software TNC, you're accessing a hardware TNC that's running a so in a software mode. It's kind of a confusing combination, but it, it gives you a hardware TNC again and some of the virtues of a hardware TNC. Well, uh, oh, and then there's also, uh, to add to that, so there's the Nexus, uh, what is it, DRX, Digital Interconnects, which is also a hat for the Raspberry Pi. So you, yeah, you, you're right, Scott. There is a category that fits kind of in between there. And who else? There was somebody else in there that wanted to talk. Steve. Well, I, I functionally the the the, pro, the category that Scott's talking about is no different than a. Uh, software TNC. It's merely a sound card connected to a computer. In this case, the computer happens to be dedicated to the task. It happens to be a $35 Raspberry Pi, but functionally it's no different than any of these other sound card modes. Just, you know, and, and Scott's correct. It's, it's one of the beauties of it is that you can put it up off in the corner of your shack and connect to it with your big computer, you know, running your big display. It's not a dedicated device. It just lives on your network. Yeah, I, that's a very good point to have brought up, Steve. I do think uh, it's nice that we continue to see these, these evolutions, really the uh, AGWPE software was the first step and that's, that mm -hmm. caught my attention way back when. I loved the idea of being able to connect a TNC to, or not a TNC, but connect a radio to a computer and stick the computer close to the antenna and then be able to access a TNC via the network for APRS or whatever other purpose I felt like that day. So that, that certainly was a, a, the first step. And then now we're seeing, yeah, with the hardware that we're talking about with drawers and the, um, Nexus board and some of these others, it's this moving into the realm of being able to truly treat the whole TNC package, the radio, well, even to the radio, depending upon how you're able to package that, treating it as an appliance, an awful lot like way back when that box really was just the box that you plugged into, in that case, their network and it provided the connectivity. So I, in some ways, I see this kind of heading full circle. So um, I took this list off of the page that Coastal Chipworks um, had for their, to help people think about a choice of using the TNCX versus their kit uh, versus a traditional TNC. And I thought it was actually very good because they didn't try to hide the ball or make it seem like the TNC X was a far superior device to everything else. What they really did was they said, you know, if you want these traditional TNC functions, you want to play with a mailbox, you want to run a BBS, you want to use these, these direct modes, the command, command and converse modes, a traditional TNC is absolutely the way to go because that's the only way you're going to get it. If you want to simply have a radio modem that is going to take care of the modulation and demodulation and this, you're going to do everything else in software. In other words, you want, you want to just use the TNC as an appliance. The TNCX or, or any other KISS TNC is absolutely the way to go. And I've got to say from personal experience, that, that that couldn't be more spot on. I For my APRS activities, I really don't want to screw around with a traditional TNC until I figured out exactly the right way to write the startup file for um, APRS IS. It was kind of a pain in the ass that my Cantronics TNC, which has both a traditional mode and a KISS mode, 
would jump out of the kiss mode and it i it would take me quite some time to figure out something was wrong i'd have to go and restart everything and it was such a pain in the butt whereas with a kiss tnc it would be virtually impossible for it to get out of that mode it would have to fail in order to not do its job but i've also had a lot of fun playing with the functions of a traditional tnc it is actually a little exciting to connect to somebody else and they have a terminal to terminal chat and uh i you know that making those connections is really a big part of amateur radio when we reach out whether it's via cw or digital mode or 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 you know voice via sideband or fm talking to another ham is part of the magic of of amateur radio and part of what draws at least some of us to this hobby so i, I think it's important to recognize that there's there's definitely still a role for traditional tncs there there, there always will be so um I, at this point, I guess, are there any questions? Not that, not that I can answer them, but with Scott and Steve and a few others around, we're certainly going to have the ability to answer questions. So, um, does anybody have any questions? So I have a simple one. Well, what is mailbox functionality and, and what does this command and converse modes actually do for you? Is this like a remote terminal? session that that is what this converse mode is is like a, you know where you can have a command line interface where what you type comes up out on the other side or i guess i don't understand what a traditional tmc would actually give you yeah that's exactly correct it would it really is it would give you the opportunity to exchange files or 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 text messages effectively i think that's kind of funny now that i say it out loud um, yeah, so so the mailbox function is a store and forward or a store, a, a connect and store thing. You can leave a message in somebody's uh, mailbox of their TNC. So you would connect to their station and you might very well upload a file to their mailbox. They don't have to be there. Other, if, if they weren't there, they would miss the message. But with the mailbox function, you're able to leave messages just like with voicemail or just like emailing a file to them it's stored in their mailbox and then they can connect to their tnc and they can manipulate whatever's in the mailbox and it may be that they're downloading the file that you saved them or they're reading the the message that you left where is so, this actually stored is it actually stored in the tnc hardware or is yes it like that's an, that's correct like eprom or something that's in there that if it loses power it Battery back RAM. Yeah. So if you look at, at the slide deck now, um, you can see, uh, let's see, I'm going to find the RAM in there. There's, I see they're here. I should know this because I've upgraded, I've hacked on one of my KCP3s. So here's, well, that's the, there we go. Thank you. Whoever's doing that, thank you. Um, yeah, there, that is the RAM. Yeah, so it's stored there. You have the battery backup so that when power is shut off, the parameters are saved, the messages are saved. So then to answer the rest of your question, the command and converse modes are two different modes. So the command mode is a mode where you're, en you're entering various commands to tell the TNC to do things. A command might be connect or it might be disconnect or it might be to change the, um, I don't, any of the, the number of parameters. I think at one time there were like, and if somebody knows better, correct me, but so I believe are these, were, are, are these like modem commands? We used to be able to send AT that would then, the modem would respond with a dot or a period, and then you could give commands to the modem. Is that this kind of technology here when we say command line? Yes, that's what I was saying, that you would give it a command to, for example, connect to a specific station, or you'd give it a command to get a listing of the stations that another TNC that you were connected to knew about. So you could get a listing of all of the recently heard uh, uh, amateur radio packet stations, and it would give you a listing of call signs 
of those stations. And that's because that's how you would connect. You connect to KB7WSD-1 or whatever. Um, so, and there are like 90 different commands. Um, I do not have, I do not have my uh, KCP3 command manual handy here, but Don just, Grant, Don just posted a link in the chat channel. Oh, excellent. Thanks, Don. I appreciate that a lot. So, so you have a whole array of, of commands that you can send to the TNC to control how it behaves. Um, I, I change the deviation. There's literally everything. And then the converse mode is just what we were talking about, where you'd enter into converse mode and you'd type something, you'd hit return, the TNC would receive that string of ASCII characters, it would send it out over the radio, the other guy would see it, he'd read, or a girl would see it, read it, and then they'd type and they'd answer back. So, and you'd, you'd converse back and forth, just like texting. Does that, does that? Yeah. Uh, Steve has his hand up too, so it might help. Okay. More. Um, the, the main distinction here is that the original TNCs, the, the classical TNCs, were designed around a human centered user interface. So you had the command mode, you would establish the connection, and then you'd be in converse mode. And this was very, when we started automating things like for email transfers and such that became very, very hard for computers to parse. You know, the scripting ran to pages. The KISS TNC, on the other hand, was designed totally to be, you know, computer centric. There was no user interface. Um, so it was much easier to automate and, and therefore many more things were practical with a KISS TNC rather than a traditional TNC. Excellent, Steve. Like that's well, you saw me taking notes as always. Excellent explanation. Um, so, does that sufficiently? Whoever was originally asking the question, I didn't didn't see who that was. Um, does yeah. that answer your question? It does. Thank you very much. I'm very glad. Any other questions? One one little bit of historical trivia is that when the KISS mode was designed, it was, it was envisioned as a, a short-term hack that would last perhaps a year or two to bridge from the traditional TNCs into what were envisioned to be much more intelligent nodes that were going to be what, what you know, it, it took us 30 years to get there. So this quick and KISS was intended as a quick and dirty hack. I think it was done over a weekend by a handful of guys who were already on the internet, you know, back in the early to mid eighties. So this is a classic example of a never, never do a quick and dirty hack that you don't intend to live forever. Yeah, that's a good example. Yeah. Any other questions? Um, I have one. Uh, can you hear me Grant or? Yeah, I sure can Don. Oh, I love that background. It's, uh, there is the KPC here plus right above me. Um, so, uh, and I don't know if I know the answer to the question, but I, I keep hearing more and more about uh, uh, Vera, Vara, and how it is awfully fast. And it, it makes me feel um, a little um, crazy that I would buy a, a, a Pactor 4 modem and spend all that money on hardware. Is, is there a point where things like Vara, the, the ability with a sound card, crosses over and exceeds what one could do with Pactor 4? Is, is there, or is there limitations in the fact that you actually need hardware for, for the, the fastest throughput? So at, at what point can you effectively offload things to any computer versus using specialized hardware, like on a Pactor mode? Well, um, I, I'm gonna, I'll answer the question in one way or maybe two ways, and then I'll open it up to some other uh, uh, thoughts and ideas. So first, um, I would say that the, the, as a prerequisite in answering it, the whole comment about Pactor 4, I think, is a little bit unusual in that. Remember that that's a protocol that's locked down. But 
and we pretty much have to buy the hardware from them because they own uh, who, and I just don't remember who it is that's the company. I'll think of it in a minute. SCS. Yeah, thank you. Pretty much, they they own the protocol. So it's it's the only way you get that, the only way you get Pactor 4 is to buy a piece of their hardware that's got it built in. Whereas, to answer your question with respect to everything else, I see it as a reliability issue. I think that Software TNCs, in some cases, are, are fantastic. But for me, I, I'm not sure that I see that they're reliable enough for some of the uses that I want to put them to. That's why I still pay a lot of attention to, and quite frankly, that's why I still use hardware TNCs. They just work. Maybe they're limited, just like I talked about, but... I can live with those limitations in those situations. And when I want to play with software TNCs, they're available too. I mean, there are, you have to admit, there are some very exciting things going on with software. So I, I think that there's always going to be room for both. And I think for me, the difference will be reliability versus bleeding edge. Does that, does that speak to what you were asking about, Don? Um, yeah, yeah. And I, and I guess, yeah, you're right. It's complicated in the SES. It's like they only sell that protocol in a box that comes with their stuff in it. Yeah, so yeah. You, you, there's no equivalent of that that you could convert over and then run in parallel and see. Um, the, I, I guess it's sort of like, where does that run? You know, is it something you get off the sound card and put on a general PC through like a USB 3.0, which is pretty fast? Or do you run it inside of a box and it just reports sort of the net activity, the compression, the decompression? So, but uh, yeah, no, that was my general question. Okay, great. Um, uh, unless anybody has any other comments, I'll talk about a couple of new developments in hardware. Uh, or does anybody have any more comments for Don? I, I have a comment. Okay, go so ahead. On your pack tour on the thing, the protocol is available to other people. It's the signal conditioning and the actual transmission, which is the problem, okay? They're using a complicated um, uh, waveform in order to get more data through. And it's like Vera and these others, they proprietary, okay? So the reason you need their box is because of what they do to shape the waveform. Just like on Vera, if you want to use Vera, you have to buy the software from the guy that gives you Vera. But it's not the protocol that's, that's the hang-up. Mm -hmm. It's the modulation. Yeah. And that's, that's part of what you pay the big money for is their sort of front end, if you will, but sort of the their ability to process and grab that signal, I guess, as well. Yeah. Okay. I, I, I have a different perspective, but tagging along very closely on what Grant is doing. What you're buying, what you're buying when you are buying a Pactor 4 modem is you are buying an appliance. It just sits there and works. It does exactly what it, they say it's going to do. It does no more, it does no less. It just sits there and works and it's dedicated and when it breaks, you can get it repaired. You can, you can get tech support on it. The VARA and every other amateur mode is, uh, well, we think it works. If you have problems, post to a mailing list and maybe you'll get some help, et cetera, et cetera. So you're, you're, buying, a, you're buying a pretty bulletproof appliance albeit a, a high-priced one, but it's just going to sit there and work. Well, I would agree with you, Steve. I think one of the things, though, Scott's point about that intermediary with processor costs coming way, way down and stuff like that, the Deer Wolf running in a, uh, on a Pi or even on an Adreno could be a, an appliance that's maintained. Okay, a company could put that out and maintain it. What you have, though, is a lot of stuff that there's no company behind Vera. There's a person behind Vera. And that's the problem, is you really need to have a company behind them. 
behind the product. And SES has been behind the Pactor stuff for years. And they, they make you pay for it. All right, thanks. I think that was, was that Dennis? I'm not seeing who's speaking, so I'm not. Yeah, that was Dennis. Okay, thanks, Dennis. I appreciate that. Um, anything else, any other comments for Don on uh, this? What's no, the typical yes, storage capacity for a traditional TNC? Uh, it's going to very much be uh, related to the amount of RAM. Uh, as I alluded to before, I had, I've upgraded my uh, KCP, well, one of my KCP3s. I've got a, I've got the Heathkit version of the PK232, and I've done a little bit of upgrading. And you can actually send uh, the PK232 off to TimeWave and have it upgraded quite a bit. Uh, Miguel just uh, noted 32 to 128K. Um, I don't have another screen that I can Google to see. I think you're capable of adding quite a bit more RAM to the uh, PK-232. <clears throat> there, so. the, the Cantronics, I believe there's a mod for the Cantronics that'll take it up to 512K. Yeah, that sounds about right. Uh, I, I'd have to look and see what I did to mine. I'd and, and for pure ASC, pure storing pure ASCII, that, that holds a lot. Yes, a, a couple of dictionaries, right? Maybe. Or, or uh, big board. Yeah. Anything else? Keep them coming. Yeah, Grant, I had a couple of comments. This is Greg. Hi, Greg. Hi. First, thanks for the presentation. Uh, I just started researching all of this in great depth over last weekend, and this has been very helpful. Thank you. Sure. A couple of comments of what I found out, though, in my in my investigations was that Chip, Coastal Chipworks no, is no longer uh, around and they no longer sell the TNCX or the TNC Pi. However, MFJ makes a version of the TNCX under their own uh, brand and uh, evidently somebody's working on getting a TNC Pi out there, but it hasn't come out yet. Um, second, one of the things that was really confusing me in all of my research is, is that different manufacturers use the, the, the acronym TNC in different ways. As you noted, some are, are KISS TNCs, which means they really aren't terminal node controllers. They're really KISS modems. They just do the modem part. But a traditional TNC includes that TNC part and includes the modem part altogether. And those traditional TNCs can also be run in KISS modes where you just ignore the TNC part. Uh, at least that's what I found out. So anybody, please correct me if I'm wrong because on any of this, because like I said, I'm just starting to learn. Um, and so what, what really helped, what really helped me is figuring out that that different manufacturers use the term TNC in different ways. And, uh, and it doesn't necessarily mean the same thing. Uh, like if you're using WinLink uh, in with a KISS TNC or a KISS modem, Winlink's actually doing all the, the contr node controlling and the protocol stuff, and the KISS TNC really is only doing the modem part. So uh, those are the comments that I had, and thanks again for the presentation. Uh, if anybody wants to correct me on any of that, please do. Thanks. Sure, sure. So um, yes, indeed, uh, John at Coastal, Coastal is kind of out of business, but there's a couple of important things to understand about that. One is um, all of that was more or less open source, the version of the TNC X that is being sold by MFJ is 1200 baud only, which is in contrast to what the TNC X that Coastal was selling. Mm -hmm. And then um, the 9600 baud kit that is the TNC Pi is actually available. You can go on Etsy tonight and order it. It is, uh, in fact, that's, uh, I'll be talking about that uh, kit, and I'll be talking about another kit in just a moment. But I think to put maybe a finer point on how to look at the labeling of the TNCs, the, the it's sort of like now describing Kleenex that used to be a brand name, and now it's a ubiquitous term that covers a, an array of things. But I think it's just as fair to call any TNC that can do traditional mode as well as KISS mode a TNC. And, and I don't see it as uh, inappropriate to call a 
a TNC that uh, is running in KISS mode a TNC, particularly because in a lot of cases, that's simply a software choice. Um, I'll, uh, I'll get to it in a minute, but I'll hold up here. Actually, I'll, well, let's see if we can do the light so you can see it. Yeah. There we go. That, so this is the Nino TNC. So it's, it's the TNC I was talking about very briefly. You pay about $12. I think it's a little cheaper in quantities like uh, Steve bought. I only bought two and I believe uh, Steve bought 10 of them. But it's about $12 for the circuit board and the pre-programmed uh, micro on it. And then uh, depending upon how carefully you shop, about $20 worth of parts, you might spend a little bit more than $20. So for under 40, I think is a safe thing. So for under $40, you get a KISS TNC, except that this TNC is only KISS because they haven't written additional code to make it a traditional TNC. Not for lack of ability of the hardware to do it. Right now, the software just simply isn't there. So I, I think that even a, a strictly KISS TNC these days can become a full-featured TNC. That's why I think it's probably fair to just, just call them all TNCs. Um, so I would, uh, if you don't, ha if you haven't had a chance yet, Greg, I would definitely go look on Etsy and uh, let's see if anybody's happened to. I'll uh, I'll see if I can't find it with the other window here. I've got to figure out what I can do and what I can't do uh, <laughs> while I've got this presentation going, but I. I can see about posting the link to the Etsy products that the TNC um, the, or the Nino TNC and the um, Raspberry Pi based TNC. And uh, yeah, those are it's, all these things are phenomenal. And there's also uh, some other hardware that sort of touches. Uh, Steve, do you happen to have a one of the Nexus? Uh, DR boards handy that you could show. I cannot. Okay, it's shoot. The top, and I'm back at the rental. I yeah, that's I. Mine is upstairs uh, where the radio is that has a good view of the world. So I I don't have it down here in the lab. Um, there's another piece of hardware that falls into that software TNC area, and that's a board that. Um, uh, but actually. Actually, Steve, you are in a much better position to give a very brief summary of the Nexus DR board. So I, I'd like to ask you to take a minute to tell people about that board. Well, what much like the, the new approach to TNCs basically boils down to coupling a very capable computer to a very capable sound card. And the Nexus DRX that's being developed by a group here in Whatcom County is just another version of that. They're marrying a Raspberry Pi computer to a very reasonable uh, sound card for the Raspberry Pi that is uh, just a hat, uh, hardware attached on top. And then they have built a kind of a bridge board that among other things just basically connects the, the Raspberry Pi's I.O. pins to the sound card and couples the audio back and forth. Um, and they, they've they added a bunch of options to just mostly to make it easy to um, interface to a whole a bunch of different radios. It's got the classic um, six pin DIN, mini DIN connector for that's called the data jack on a lot of radios, but it also has uh, the uh, the eight pin connector that's ubiquitous on amateur radios for microphones, um, sim and very very similar to the Signal Link USB. So th they the main thing that they created was a plug and play um, hardware or software stack consisting of the Raspberry Pi OS and the drivers and an application called, um, er, forgotten already, 
Help me, Grant. Um, <laughs> I completely forgot this. It's been a long day. Um, what? Sorry, I uh, had stepped away to go grab my okay. Nexus DR. So what were you saying, Steve? I didn't hear what you where you were. I, I can't oh. I can't remember the uh, the application that they're running on these things. It's kind of the hard. Oh and stuff, oh, oh FSQ the fast QSO mode uh, in FL Digi, which is it's cool. Again, it is one of those things that I get excited about because it takes us back to the roots of you know one on one contact. So, uh, and I think that, uh, actually, I'm glad you're touching on that, Steve, because I think that's also one of the fantastic things that, that Bud <laughs> and the other Steve are doing up there is making, what were you telling me? There are 80 people that are participating in this? Is that At correct? least 80. Yeah. So, and that's, it's all, if everybody could see this, it's just this little stack. Oh, I need a better light set up here. Um, how am I doing this? Yeah. I need a studio. So if you look at the bottom level is the Raspberry Pi. Uh, this is just, here we go. Ha ha. Okay. So now you can see, I can provide light now. So you can see at the bottom of the stack is the Raspberry Pi and there's an intermediate board in the middle it's the sound card, and then at the top is the Nexus DR board, and you can see, let me hold the light around here. You can see those are the two jacks that Steve was talking about, and you have on the opposite end, you have here, you have an RJ45 instead of the mini DINs, and you have the power connector and a power regulator on there. And then you have here, you can see, if everybody can see this okay, you can see the cables that run from the sound card, which is what's interfaced to the Raspberry Pi. Well, actually they both are, but the sound card is interfaced to the Raspberry Pi as well. And so that, that in essence right there is the whole stack. And um, Steve, uh, the, so Bud did the hardware. Well, you already talked about this, right? Uh, not really, but oh, okay. Uh, so talk about that part then. WB7 FHC has been kind of the guiding light of this, and he's he's done a yeoman job of forming a community here in Whatcom County and kind of played Pied Piper with this system. So there have been build parties with as many as 12 people building Bud's board and then slapping the stack together. The, you bring your own Raspberry Pi. You pay Bud $35 for the, a bag of parts, and then you sit there and solder it together. They hand you a, a, S, a micro SD card to stick in it, and basically it comes up, it boots up the Raspberry Pi OS and immediately goes into the FL Digi app, which you can use FSQ on. You plug it into a radio, and you are on the air with a network of as many as 80 people here in Whatcom County and surrounding areas. And FSQ is not packet radio as, as we know it, but it is a very robust um, chat sys application um, that has amazing signal to noise ratio compatibility. So it, it, it runs on everything from really crappy bow fangs to your, your 25 watt mobile radio and everything in between. And it, and it does a wonderful job of bridging, you know, the amateur, the, di the digitally inclined amateurs here in Watchcom County together, there's a net every Sunday morning, you know, for, that runs for hours. Now, what, what Bud did was kind of, kind of showcase the magic of being able to build something and slap it together with a, you know, onto a Raspberry Pi and, you know, have this little appliance running. But there's nothing fundamentally new about what he's doing, you know, with FL Digi and FSQ. That can be running on a Windows PC and a um, Signal Link USB. Um, it's the same. It's the same software recompiled for a PC. But the point is that you know there's you can build with a Raspberry Pi and make it into you know what we now call an appliance, and it just sits there and works. So as you've described, isn't that very similar to a draws? 
It, it is absolutely. In fact, this group actually started with the draws until they kind of had a parting of the ways with Northwest Digital Radio that Northwest Digital Radio made it a little too sophisticated for what they wanted, so they went off on their own. Okay. Yeah, they're, they're, absolutely. There's the, the Northwest Digital Radio uses a different sound chip, a little bit more capable. Um, you know, it's, it's pre-assembled. Um, they, you know, the, the, the support here in Whatcom County is totally peer-to-peer. -peer. There's a bit of company support from Northwest Digital Radio, but it's also a lot more peer-to-peer. -peer. Um, so, yeah, it's, it, you, you got to, you choose your use case of who's doing what that you're interested in, you go for it. And I'm, I'm playing in both camps, uh, Northwest Digital Radio and the um, Nexus DR here in Whatcom County. Well, and I think one of the important things to keep in mind is the fundamental difference in price that we're talking about. Uh, uh, what was it total? I'm trying to remember how much I paid, but I think it with the with the Raspberry Pi, I know it was, and the sound card and everything, it was well under a hundred bucks. Um, or it was under a hundred bucks. I think it was around eighty. Does that sound about right, Steve? Yes, that's correct. Yeah. So, and compare that to um, a little more than twice that for the Northwest Digital Radio product. Um, like, like Steve said, I, I looked at it and said, well, which way do I want to go? I like soldering. I'd rather build my own. The, the last little bit of features that, that you would get with the Northwest Digital Radio package, at least right now, they're not important to me. So that, that's kind of where I came from. I also uh, posted the link to the Etsy listing for the uh, TNC Pi 9600 baud Raspberry Pi hat. Well, Grant, that's a that that particular product is a 1200 or 9600. It's capable of 9600, but it it can do 1200 also. Oh yeah, yeah, that's correct. Yeah. I, I didn't mean to apply the other anything else but that, yeah. Anybody have any comments, questions, thoughts, whatever? Uh, Grant, the web page says you can support two radios? Yeah, that's correct. So if you, um, if you look, you can see that there are two different mini DINs so you can either use both of those, or you could use the RJ45 and one of the mini DINs, or I don't know if we're going to be able to see this. Well, let me get my flashlight. Or uh, let's see, how do I light this? I need to buy, Scott was telling me about great LED lighting for webcams. So if you look right next to my finger there, you can see oh, yeah, that big yeah. header. Yeah. So you can actually uh, wire directly into the board. So those are the same connections that are available at the two mini DINs over here. So you can wire here. And then there's um, an additional uh, TRS connection over here as well. So you can wire from the sound card in a different way as well right here mm -hmm. so it's it really is kind of a swiss army knife i i was really uh profoundly impressed by all the teeny little features they added to this thing it was it's i'm i'm excited about it i played with it some i need to get somebody else i really want to try out the fsq mode but there's nobody close enough to me uh right right now to do that so i've i've been trying to figure out how to entice one of my friends to <laughs> Get on the air with that. The uh, other question is, do you run the ham pie image fairly generically, or do you add stuff to that? Because it looks like the project is using the, the ham pie image. I, I have changed nothing on it right now. Um, I'm still, I would say I'm still in, very much in the exploration pay, uh, phase. Um, I do have a couple of different SD chips 
um, that are that have different built amateurs because I've also been playing with trying to come up with an ideal configuration for portable use digital modes with my KX3 and my 817 or seven uh, yeah 817 and um, so I, I I haven't wanted to disturb stuff that I've been working with so that's why I've been using different cards to hold the state of things for different uh, different modes of experimentation I guess is a good way of putting it what one of the things that they they're doing here in Watkin County is that they will they're not because the Raspberry Pi is a Linux system, they're not forcing people to learn the guts of Linux, like, you know, go compile it, you know, and, and, and download new software. They're just handing them SD cards and burning the software onto them, and then they can basically get up and running. That's the only way that they've been able to scale this, because they're not trying to make people into Raspberry Pi experts, they're trying to make them into digital communicators and they're teaching them the commands, the user interface of, of FL Digi and FSQ rather than trying to get them to learn Linux. Yeah. Which is working. Yeah, well, it, it definitely works for me. I, uh, <laughs> I appreciated how simple and easy it was to get started and it made it, it, it allowed me to focus on experimentation and not not having to take excruciating notes to figure out how to recreate what I did yesterday. Yeah, that's neat to be able to provide the whole image as a starting point versus having to deal with all the, the cross dependencies. Seems neat. I have a question for you, um, yeah. or the group maybe. I'm curious if. Um, has there ever been any BBS software written for ham radio? Oh, yeah. Steve, why don't you talk about this one? Yes, we, we have had many generations of BBS software. Um, the, I cannot remember um, the name of the suite. There's also one that is a favorite of a good friend of mine called Janos. Um, and, but there, <laughs> Yes, there are many. There are many implementations of BBSs. Um, there's also some really good implementations of amateur radio networking that are surprisingly robust, even running at as slow as 1,200 bits per second. So, yeah, yes, it's all out there, and it's all Linux, and it's all been ported to the Raspberry Pi. Um, there, there's even there's even a, a an entire Linux distribution which basically throws everything. Oh, thank you, Bill. It's called Lin BPQ, L I N B P Q. And and Grant just posted the Oh, yeah. So, yes, there are BBSs and I think BBSs are going to make a comeback because they're just simple technology that works, especially in an emergency. If you know where to go, the information is going to be be there. So I just posted a link to, I just did a quick Google because I thought, yeah, I have no idea what the state of things is there. And one of the first hits that looked kind of popular and hit all my buzzwords is this uh, F6FBB. And I, I, now that I'm saying it out loud, I believe I've heard about this before. Um, reading the Wikipedia page on it, uh, that it's been ported to, it was written in C, um, yeah, it was originally an MS-DOS program, and now the current versions uh, run on Linux and 32-bit Windows, so uh, they're out there, definitely out there. Oh, here we go. Uh, looks like there is even a web page curated by 3, no, N3HYM on wow it's taken a long time to load oh no this is just his okay no never mind this is just his bulletin board system okay oh 
Telnet BBS? Uh, yeah, at the Telnet BBS guide. That's what I pulled up. Oh, but that's – yeah, that, that's the – basically replacing dial-up lines – with Telnet for classic BBSs. Yeah. Oh, this is fun. Oh, yeah. they, have a, they have a listing there of some amateur radio BBSs. Really? Oh, okay, cool. Yeah, well here, I'll actually, I'll, let me, that was the one I found. Let me get the URL and I'll post the URL so everybody can look at that. Here we go. There we go. That's the one I was just looking at, the N3HYM Amateur Radio BBS. And apparently it has, wow, I don't know if they have a protocol that is not there. Vera, Pactor, yeah, I don't, if they're missing something, I'm not really sure what it will be. <laughs> Any other questions? Comments? Anything? Um, Grant, I'm crushed that you didn't use my line about being able to run TCP IP over packet. Uh, didn't I? Nope. It's in the notes. Hang on, let me look. Shame on me. So for those of you who want to oh, really yeah. experience and, and, and really get down and dirty, uh, you can do, absolutely can do uh, TCP IP over amateur radio over packet and using these KISS modems. So, um, and it's a lot of fun and you learn a lot about the guts of packet radio and, uh, or sorry, TCP IP. It's how I learned and it's totally practical. It, it works well enough on, at 1200. It uh, works reasonably well at 96. So find a buddy pick up platform and start playing. Yeah. I, 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 can, I couldn't say uh, any better what Steve just said. Find a package, find a platform, start, find a buddy and start playing. There's so much here for us. It's just so much. And really it's a, it's a way to use some of the spectrum that we're not making a lot of use of right now. Uh, I, you know, especially on UHF and above, there's some, some things we can make some good use of stuff. We should. Um, what before we go? Um, we keep talking about 9600, but that's not exactly the, the bleeding edge right now for VHF and UHF. Um, we touched on using VARA, which is a at the moment it's a proprietary mode that you ultimately have to pay for, but um, this guy has managed to do something that nobody else did, and that and that's being able to reliably do 20 kilobits per second, 20, 20 kilobits per second over a 20 kilohertz VHF UHF channel. And it's, it's being experimented with in the Puget Sound area by a couple of, at least a couple of guys and uh, it's working. With, and the, the guys that are doing the experimentation are crusty old veterans of all this. So if they're saying it works, I, I believe them and, I'm just going to pay the 60 bucks or whatever the author wants and be able to run it on my systems. And it's, a, and it's a sound card mode. It doesn't require any exotic hardware. All right. Uh, let's see. So I don't know anybody else, anything else? Actually, uh, was it Nathan? Where is it? Uh, he had a question that I have never seen anything about this Apex APRS extended. Uh, I, I'm not familiar with that at all. I don't know if anybody has any. Uh, I noticed nobody responded to him, but if anybody I, has any information, that'd be interesting. Um, so the, the, you're talking about the Apex protocol, the extended protocol? Is that because I didn't? I've got to apologize. I didn't have the chat window open, so I missed a lot of the stuff. It wasn't until I think Steve said something about Bill posting or something early on that it was like I knew that there was a chat window, I just wasn't looking at it, so I apologize. 
if there were any other questions there that I missed, um, please please bring them up again so we can address it. So, so a few days ago, I was looking up AX25 in res with respect to using a APRS cable to my handheld radio. And when I started looking into APRS protocol, it talked about Bell 202, some uh, protocol from 40 years ago. This whole AX25 is very old. And some people have kind of started pushing the limits of APRS by extending the protocol. And it, it's called APRS Extended. Yeah, I, I'm vaguely familiar with it. I haven't looked into it a lot. Uh, my understanding is Apex was focusing on doing uh, sh uh, either short haul or long haul data, I don't remember which, using HF for APRS. Um, and from an APRS standpoint, that I, I get it if you're isolated and you're not somewhere where you have internet connectivity, but for the most part, APRS lives and dies <laughs> by the internet connectivity because there's just such a ridiculously massive amount of data that particularly on the RF side of things that exists. So it's really just a, if I understood what it was, it's really just a protocol for hauling APRS data around. It's not actually an extension of APRS features. Is that consistent with what, because you've looked, you've obviously you've looked at it much more recently than me, because I had looked at it and it was like, oh, this doesn't address anything that I'm concerned with right now. So, so, so AX25 is doing frequency shift keying, and it's basically bouncing back and forth between two frequencies. And I guess, you know, the limit right now is about 9,600 baud. And I believe the Apex protocol was trying to add compression and air correction to the protocol, you know, and maybe even extending the speed. You're confusing the AX25 protocol with the modulation technique. So AX25 is the protocol that goes out over the air of which APRS is a superset of it piggybacks onto AX25. There's been various optimizations over the years to make it more efficient to, to essentially compress the messages that go out, actually go out over the air to contain more information to compensate for the relatively slow speed and the high number of collisions. There are, as we just discussed, there's 9,600 bits per second modulation, and now there's a 20K modulation that you, and by the way, using the use of AX25 is totally optional. It just happens to be the one that is the most widely used and embedded into things as small as little APRS appliances. But there's a lot of people who've done things as weird as, what was the, what was the Microsoft Net, NetBuoy? We've done NetBuoy over amateur radio. We've done uh, IPX, SPX. We've done raw ethernet frames actually have been sent over, you know, the air. So, it's wide open, and that's that's why to, when I when I get to talk to somebody who's a young person who's thinking about getting involved in amateur radio because they're curious about wireless communications, I say it's literally a license to experiment with wireless communications. So, what was the name of that modulation technique that does uh, twenty kilobaud? Vara, V A R A. Thank you. The one that you want to look up is Vara, V-A-R-A dash F-M. You'll find it quickly. Excellent. Thank that's, you. that's the product. The modulation scheme is OFM. OFD. Orgonal frequency multiplexing. Thank you. Uh -huh. Sure. Scott, were there any other questions? Not that I noticed. Who, did anybody else have anything here? I see some. There's lots of good information in the chat channel. I'm going to capture this and send it out. Um, I don't see any other questions unless somebody wants to pipe up here. I think this worked great. I uh, just 
This is a, a great microhands meeting. So kudos Grant and, and Scott for setting it up. Yeah, thanks Scott. I appreciate all your work. I, uh, I did the easy thing. I just raced around for a couple of days and slapped together a half-assed PowerPoint. <laughs> you were the one that had to keep this three ring show going. Boy, those are a lot of badges you've got back there, dude. Yeah, a few. Yeah, just a few. Does anybody else have anyone anything going? Uh, where did we lose? Dennis looks like he's still awake. I'm I'm still here. Oh, I went Dennis Tillman. Oh, I see him. I can't see you. Yeah, I turned the camera off. I'm still here. I'm gonna call it an evening, gentlemen. <laughs>